Coming up on New Day at Arirang. South Korea is expected to report more than 7,000 new COVID-19 infections on Wednesday. This comes as Omicron variant cluster infections continue across the nation. The World Health Organization has called for all nations to be well prepared for the further spread of COVID-19, adding that the highly transmissible Omicron variant could be the dominant strain in many more countries. And South Korea expressed its deep concern to Japan after electrical company TEPCO requested regulatory approval to release radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the sea. Hello and welcome to this Wednesday edition of New Day at Adirang. It's 8 a.m. on December 22nd here in Seoul, South Korea, just a few days away from Christmas now. Uh, thank you ever so much for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. And I'm Kim Mogan. Now, over the next hour, we'll take a look at the big news stories of the day and get expert insights on the issues facing Korea and the world. Right. Our top story this morning, COVID-19 cases are spreading among unvaccinated children in South Korea. This according to the government. Officials also warning the Omicron variant is threatening to become the dominant strain here as well, like many other countries in the near future. For more COVID-19 related updates, we have a reporter Kim Yun-sung here in the studio. Welcome, Yun-sung. Good morning, Mugyun. So, Yun-sung, what do we have for today? Right, so South Korean government officials are actually prepping for a new announcement today as hospitals grapple with the rise in critical cases. President Moon Jae-in has ordered authorities to spare no effort in securing extra ICU beds and buffing up COVID-19 front lines with more medical personnel. Details on how authorities plan to do so will come in today's announcement, which I'll be here to report at a later time. Okay, and uh, how's the forecast looking? Normally we have figures up to a certain point in the evening the previous day, so how's it looking for Wednesday? Right, so Wednesday is expected to bring another daily tally over 7,000. Uh, health authorities marked up to 6,440 new COVID-19 infections by 9 p.m. Tuesday. Wednesday is typically the day that the nation sees a surge in daily cases during the week because health authorities conduct almost double the amount of tests on weekdays compared to weekends. So even though health authorities have said that infections have been appearing to slow down a bit in recent days, we really need to wait until the end of this week to detect a shift in infection trends if there is any. So, Yansin, what has been the driving force behind the recent cases? Well, infections have been rising among young children, especially elementary schoolers. The average daily cases of infections among elementary school students have almost doubled in the first two weeks of December from 2,470 to 4,325. Authorities attribute the surge to the lack of vaccinations. Currently, the overall risk of COVID-19 infection is increasing, especially among unvaccinated age groups, adolescents, and those under 11, and those who are unable to get vaccinated. Right, so meanwhile, among middle school students, a group that's seeing an increase in vaccination rates, infections have gone down. Cases have gone from an average of 1,650 a day to 1,500 within the first two weeks of this month. Now, uh, what we keep hearing about in regards to COVID-19 around the rest of the world is Omicron because it is affecting uh, the vast majority of Europe and North America right now. But we're also seeing more and more of it here in South Korea, correct? Exactly. Omicron is growing as a concern in South Korea as well. So there were two new Omicron clusters found in the country. 20 new Omicron cases were linked to a kindergarten in Iksan. 18 of the infected were kindergartners, while two were their family members. After tracing the people the infected patients have come into contact with, authorities have found 55 other suspected cases of Omicron. The variant has also spread to Gwangju City in Jeollanamdo province, with nine new cases detected in the region. This totals up to 29 new cases in a day, adding up to a caseload of 227. Omicron cases have jumped 45-fold within just 20 days in South Korea. Experts say that the Omicron strain may outpace other variants in a couple of months and become the dominant strain. It already is in a number of countries. Take a listen. We can see another storm coming. Omicron is becoming or already 
has become dominant in several countries, including Denmark, Portugal, and the United Kingdom, where its numbers are doubling every one and a half to three days. So, Yansin, how is the world preparing for this storm? Well, the U.S. is coordinating a global response to combat the, against Omicron. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met virtually with foreign ministers and leaders of regional organizations on Tuesday local time. They shared ideas, information and insight on how to battle this global threat together. The U.S. has also promised to fund 580 million U.S. dollars uh, for, of aid for its multilateral partners to further support global health efforts. And the United States is also being hit very hard by this Omicron variant as well. It now accounts for roughly three quarters of all the new cases there. Exactly. So U.S. President Joe Biden actually made a speech to, uh, Tuesday local time specifically regarding this fresh new surge of Omicron. He said that Omicron is a cause for concern, but not of panic. Also, in light of the climbing cases, the administration will distribute 500 million free at-home COVID kits to the American public and deploy military medical personnel to the COVID-19 front lines. He also urged the public to get vaccinated before they go ahead and enjoy the upcoming holidays. If you are vaccinated, and follow the precautions that we all know well. You should feel comfortable celebrating Christmas and the holidays as you planned it. All right, Jensen, thank you so much for your packed report. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Thank you very much to our Kim Yon Soon for that reporting. Now we're going to move away from uh, COVID. A year ago, the South Korean government hosted its first big summit with business leaders in three key industries, namely, uh, semiconductors, eco-friendly cars, and biohealth. And next year, there are plans to spend billions of dollars to support EVs, semiconductor research, and digital infrastructure for the health sector. Kim Sang-min tells us more. By 2025, South Korea aims to become a global leader in the so-called Big Three sectors, system semiconductors, next-generation cars, and biohealth. And to achieve that goal, the country plans to go all out in the coming year, expanding its support for the sectors. By continuing the advanced technology seen in the semiconductors, producing the world's best electric and hydrogen fuel cars, and opening the bioeconomy era, the country will put maximum efforts into taking the lead in these sectors in the global market. To do that, the government has set aside some 5.3 billion U.S. dollars of its budget next year for the three sectors, 43 percent more than in 2021. Part of the plan is to expand the total supply of eco-friendly cars to up to 500,000. That's more than double the current supply. Some 65,000 eco-friendly car buyers are expected to receive subsidies for cars priced above $46,000. Benefiting from the expected increase in demand, South Korea's biggest automaker, Hyundai Motor Group, on the same day announced it is ramping up its annual global sales goal for 2026 to 1.7 million from the previous 1 million. For the biohealth industry, the government plans to establish a digital infrastructure where people can be provided with medical services based on their health information. Issuing digital healthcare data will be part of this plan. As for the system sector, including AI semiconductors, around $370 million will be injected to support research and development. The big three are also expected to enjoy expanded tax incentives next year, along with other strategic industries set by the government. The government is also aiming to pass a new law that will provide a legal foundation to allow these plans to proceed. Kim Sung-min, Arirang News. South Korea's central bank is warning that if the global supply crisis isn't resolved soon, consumer prices will keep on rising. On Tuesday, the Bank of Korea said that while there are signs of this happening now, inflation in South Korea is not as pronounced as in other wealthy nations. However, according to the report, other factors pose more of a threat. The BOK says the imbalance in energy supply and demand, livestock, product prices, the shortage of semiconductors for vehicles and delays in maritime logistics could cause inflationary pressure. 
Starting next Monday, South Korea's Ministry of SMEs and Startups will start making relief payments to small businesses that had to restrict operations because of social distancing. Those eligible will each get 1 million won, about 840 U.S. dollars. In total, these payments are worth around $2.7 billion, and they're going to some 3.2 million businesses. Officials are calling these payments quarantine subsidies. Once the full extent of the damage is clear, it will also pay small businesses compensation, as the details of which will be decided later. Now it's time for On Point, where we speak to experts to delve deeper into the biggest news stories in the spotlight right now. It was widely expected, but last month the Bank of Korea hiked interest rates for the second time in a period of just three months. The benchmark rate uh, rose 25 basis points. It's now sitting at 1 percent. Policymakers also signaled there will be more hikes as they look to try and keep a lid on inflation and uh, Korea's notoriously a uh, big problem with household debt. For 2022, the inflation outlook was lifted to 2% from an earlier projection of 1.5%. And watchers expect the next rate hike could come as soon as next month. That will be just a couple of months ahead of South Korea's presidential election in March. This worries a sizable portion of the population, with some experts even suggesting it could even collapse the housing market, with home prices in Seoul almost doubling over the past five years alone. What effect will these rate hikes and inflation have on people in South Korea? For more, we connect to Song Soo-young, a professor of economics at Chungang University. Good morning, Professor Song. Yeah, good morning. Uh... Well, um, with interest rates increasing, how much pressure is this going to put on households already burdened with stagnant wage growth and pandemic restrictions, among other things? And do you share concerns these rapid fire rate uh, hikes could potentially cause a catastrophic collapse of the housing market? Okay, as for the first question, I have uh, my personal calculation about uh, how much uh, the burden would be uh, impact on the household debt. Actually, uh, according to the uh, data that the 75 percent of the household borrowing is uh, consisted with the variable uh, loan interest rate. So that is reached 1844.9 trillion Korean won. So assuming, because this is just a hypothetical uh, calculation, so assuming half of the working age population owes some debt, on average, uh, the one percentage increase of the interest rate could increase the burden as much as uh, 760,000 Korean won, which is equivalent to 630 US dollars per month. But this is a hypothetical. I mean, maybe just uh, I assume that half of working age population has, uh, to some degree, they borrow the money from the bank. But if you increase the number of the loan for their populations, clearly this would be uh, reduced. So, and for the, is, is there any possibility of the rapid fire hike? Yeah, rapid fire hike, more than 1% within uh, just a month or uh, in, in each next three months, if the Bank of Korea could increase as of uh, as high as one uh, percent or two percent, that could cause a really serious threat against the economy. But uh, BOK will not do that. Uh, it's uh, most unlikely for them to do that. And uh, also, according to the Federal Reserve projection of the next year's uh, inflation rate, is uh, uh, relatively very. Uh, attenuating, I mean, the, it, it is declining because uh, current current position is because of the, as the anchor has mentioned, the some maritime logistics uh, congestion and the other things, supply uh, di uh, disruption. So that must be a uh, transitory. So as long as that is uh, remains transitory, then uh, in the future, the inflation will inflation rate will be uh, decreased and then uh, there is not no not much uh, reason to increase the interest rate. 
Right, and we must remember that historically speaking, even 1% is still very low uh, interest rate. So even if they raise it up to one and a half, two percent 2%, still very low if you, we look back a few decades. But some experts are laying the blame for inflation on the government's uh, money printing, giving out mm -hmm. this uh, financial support wave after wave uh, to give to those most affected by the pandemic uh, due to all the uh, related restrictions and whatnot. How much do you think the inflation we're feeling right now is down to the pandemic and the way the government has reacted to it? Mm -hmm. Okay, the, uh, no, the general notion of the some government's rampant uh, money printing would be the main cause of the inflation and the failure of government. But that owes to Milton Friedman's uh, argument. But uh, his argument is mostly uh, proved as groundless because the evidence shows that the monetary base, the printing money, is not at all related with inflation. Only the M2, that is the uh, addition of the monetary base, plus some the, uh, increased and uh, multiplied uh, supply of money. But however, economic activity, the declining ec economy, depression of the economic activity caused the money supply to decrease. Or So the causality is uh, totally the other way around. So I believe that... Uh, Currently, the economic behavior, economic activities uh, recover, recover what it used to be as long as uh, the pandemic is, uh, effect is re reduced and the supply chain disruption could be re removed. And also the people, once uh, in the position of a furlough or layoff, go, to, go back to what uh, they used to have. Uh, then the economy is on the recovery path and in the normal path uh, uh, in the near in the near near future. But what I'm most concerned is about the uh, if the this kind of uh, long-lasting follow and layoff could be uh, could be uh, could lead to the some decreasing productivity of the labor. Then it could have uh, the same effect as the increase of the wage. And that could be a, some kind of burden to the economy. And then uh, as long as the labor productivity is decreased, so without any further some new uh, escape route or the gross, uh, uh, gross route is not uh, available, then we may be uh, doomed to the economy such as uh, uh, Japanese economy, the, which have suffered as, uh, three decades of lost decade. So other, otherwise, uh, I think uh, the prospect is not that uh, bad at all. And lastly, Professor, um, mm -hmm. numerous South Korean administrations stretching back years have tried every trick in the book to bring down housing prices, but um, they've almost exclusively <laughs> failed. And um, if other countries can handle housing prices to a reasonable degree, why mm -hmm. is South Korea unable to find a way? But at least the current situation in the Korean housing market is uh, much better than Spain or Italy, Greece, Ireland in the wake of 2008 crisis. And uh, recent uh, surge of house price is, all, uh, of course, is problematic and uh, it uh, produced the impression that is a failure of the government control. But I believe two reasons, two causes. But in 2016, the leniency and the relaxation of the uh, regulation of the relative loan to value and then the decrease the interest uh, loan uh, interest loan rate so that is uh, so many uh, because people are ready to purchase then uh, before the pandemic and the, we saw the economy the uh, Korean economy has showed has shown the uh, impression to recover much earlier than other countries then uh, it has uh, the money has uh, provided to the housing market. That is a uh, main cause. And in addition to that, the particularly the supply of the residents' home surrounding areas of Seoul and the Gyeonggi vicinities, because it, that is uh, we have con uh, population concentration is uh, very high and almost 60 per 60 
60 percentage of the population has gathered around the Seoul and Gyeonggi area. So shortage of the temporary shortage of the supply in this area could cause a hike of the housing price. But I think I believe this is basically the bully whip effect on the housing market. So bully effect is uh, people's order more, and because of the some psychological panic and the ordering uh, earlier, and then uh, they try to hold. But this should be controlled and regulated by the government. Uh, so the market is, I don't think it's uh, properly working and control is a situation at all. So what is needed right now is a firm uh, determination of the government to restrict and uh, con uh, continue the current uh, uh, some, uh, strict control of the uh, loan. And then we could easily see that the increase of the high uh, price. But however, for the increase of interest rate, uh, I think a BOK and uh, must, must, must remain very cautious about that because it could have uh, some uh, too fast and uh, too much hike of interest that could cause uh, devastating damage on the economy of the recovery of the economy uh, growth. Okay, Professor, thank you very much uh, for your time. We appreciate you uh, making time in your schedule to speak to us and sharing your insights, and we hope we can speak to you again soon. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Now, Japan announced plans this year to discharge treated radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant. Neighboring countries, including South Korea, naturally have and continue to express their concerns that their waters may very well be polluted by this water. And now, as Tokyo has submitted a request for approval to go ahead with the release Seoul has again reiterated its strong opposition. Kim Do-yeon with this report. South Korea has expressed deep concern to Japan after its electrical company, TEPCO, on Tuesday requested regulatory approval to release treated radioactive water from Fukushima nuclear power plant into the sea. South Korea held an emergency vice ministerial meeting and the country's nuclear safety chief affirmed their stance on the matter. To share the main points of the letter, we requested that during the process of collecting opinions, in addition to Japan, other countries' opinions should be taken into account as well as while cooperating with the international community. In addition, we requested that relevant information should be transparent and Japan be cooperative and prompt to South Korea's request to confirm the release is safe. This was the second time South Korea used its Nuclear Safety Commission as a means to send a message to Japan. The first time was earlier this year when Japan said it had decided to push for the discharge of more than 1 million tons of the water into the ocean. TEPCO's appeal for regulatory approval this time around was around 500 pages long, detailing how the water will be released as well as the extent of the dilution process. The firm said pumps would move the treated water from the tanks to the seashore and through a seabed tunnel before releasing it at a depth of 12 meters and about one kilometer out at sea. South Korean authorities plan on examining the appeal thoroughly and will request additional information. They will also strengthen its watch over the levels of radioactivity in the sea. Currently, it has 32 spots in coastal waters to check for levels of tritium and cesium, and it is planning to add two more spots, with more frequent checks being carried out. Kim do Arirang News. Russian President Vladimir Putin is warning he'll consider a military response if Russia feels threatened by NATO. According to local media outlets, Putin told his top military commanders Tuesday that the West is to blame for the tensions over Ukraine. Putin said Moscow will take proportionate military countermeasures to unfriendly steps if the West continues what he called its clearly aggressive line. Watchers say Putin's remarks signal he's not ready anytime soon to de-escalate tensions over Ukraine. And Russia has reportedly cut its natural gas exports to Europe, causing prices to skyrocket across the continent as the middle of winter sets in as well. While some say this move is due to the tensions over Ukraine, Moscow insists that just isn't the case. 
Kim Hyo-sun reports. Amid simmering tensions between Russia and European nations, Moscow has decided to cut the flow of gas supplies to Europe. The move has sent prices surging as the continent prepares for a week of sub-zero temperatures. Over the weekend, shipments through the Yamal pipeline that runs through Belarus and Poland to Germany were at their lowest point in at least a month. Russian media outlets explained that daily shipments fell from 27 million cubic meters last Friday to around 5 million cubic meters over the weekend. In addition, westward gas flows through the pipeline stopped on Tuesday, according to Reuters, which added the gas may have been redirected back to Russia. While some Western politicians and pundits have accused Russia of halting gas deliveries amid political tensions over Ukraine, Moscow denies any connection. Some have also pointed out that Russia's move could be in connection to delays in the certification of Nord Stream 2, a Baltic Sea pipeline built to ship natural gas from Russia to Germany. A Kremlin spokesperson said Tuesday that this is, quote, a purely commercial situation. Europe is largely dependent on imported gas, with Russia supplying 40 percent or more of those imports. Kim Yosan, Arirang News. China has announced sanctions on four American officials in retaliation for penalties imposed on Chinese officials over complaints of abuses in the Xinjiang province. According to the Associated Press Tuesday, China's foreign ministry said the chairman and three members of the U.S. government's Commission on International Religious Freedom are barred from visiting mainland China, Hong Kong and Macau. Any assets they have in those places will also be frozen. China threatened retaliation after the U.S. Treasury Department imposed sanctions this month on two Chinese officials accused of involvement in the repression of Uyghur Muslims and other minorities in Xinjiang. China continues to deny all accusations of human rights abuses. South Korea and China will hold high-level strategic talks over video this week, the first bilateral session of its kind in more than four years. According to the Seoul's foreign ministry Tuesday, Vice, First Vice Foreign Minister Choi jong gun and his Chinese counterpart will hold the ninth strategic dialogue on Thursday. They plan to discuss ways to develop ties in a forward-looking way and strengthen cooperation on regional and global security issues. South Korea sending a government delegation to the Beijing Winter Games in February is also likely to be on the agenda. Right, it's that time where we cross over to our Oseong for global insight and an in-depth look at important development in world affairs. Thank you, Mark. It is indeed time for Global Insight, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. Now, governments around the world have expressed concern that freedom is no more in Hong Kong. A Legislative Council election took place over the weekend with 90% of the seats awarded to pro-China candidates. Only 30% of Hong Kong's 4.2 million voters had gone to the polls, and many observers say that the election was widely boycotted by the people who lost faith in the electoral system and the region's governance after relentless crackdowns by Beijing and local authorities, which imposed a repressive national security law on the people of Hong Kong. Now, under the Sino-British Agreement, Hong Kong is promised certain democratic freedoms as a semi-autonomous region, separate from mainland China, until the year 2047. But is the one country, two systems now effectively dead? Joining us to discuss the future of Hong Kong and what it means for the people is Lev Nachman, postdoctoral research fellow at the Harvard University Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies, and Eric Lei, Hong Kong Law Fellow at Georgetown Center for Asian Law. Very warm welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us. And well, let's start with you, Mr. Lackman. Now, Beijing has blamed the pandemic and what it called anti-China elements for the low voter turnout of around 30.2%. Uh, but many reports say that citizens were actually out and about in Hong Kong, but just not in polling stations. What did you make of the turnout that day? With turnout so low, this really shows that uh, Hong Kongers no longer see their electoral system as meaningful or something worth participating in. Uh, when the government puts on these mass campaigns to promote people to vote, they had free uh, public transportation, there were campaigns all around the city encouraging people to vote. 
Uh, and people mo were most certainly out and about. They took advantage of the free public transportation, but no one was going to vote. And I really think this shows that Hong Kongers really see a qualitative difference in their political institutions now that there has been these uh, big reforms and changes into who is allowed to run uh, and just how much of a pro-Beijing slant uh, every electoral position now has to have. Mr. Lei, how did you see this election? I mean, even if there had been a higher turnout, do you think the results would have looked more or less the same? The result would have been more or less the same, uh, given the fact that this new electoral system prohibits any meaningful opposition to participate uh, in the campaign and in the elections. And let us not to forget that there should have been uh, more than 47 uh, opposition candidates running for these elections, but now they are all in jail under the national security law imposed last year. And this new electoral system not only prohibits them to run for elections, but prohibits, prohibits anyone who are general opposition because all the candidates are now filtered by a new review committee that they will decide who can run for elections based on the investigation of national security police in Hong Kong. And well, Mr. Lackman, now we now 90% of the seats they've been taken over by pro-Beijing uh, candidates and they've expressed excitement or um, well eagerness to you know get to work and talk about uh, issues that need to be addressed in the city but can we expect any genuine discourse and deliberation to take place in this new legislature or is it now simply a smaller model of China's rubber stamp parliament? Like Eric pointed out, any meaningful opposition who wanted to run in these elections have either been jailed or have been silenced completely. Uh, and the result is that every elected official in Hong Kong now is going to completely toe the pro-Beijing line. Uh, no one is going to be able to offer any sort of meaningful dissent or any sort of opposing opinion from Beijing. Uh, and in fact, it would arguably, arguably be dangerous for them to do so. Uh, and unfortunately, what that means is that Hong Kong's Legislative Council is largely going to be uh, just another uh, uh, repeating talking point for Beijing. Uh, a lot of the same messages are going to be coming across from both uh, outlets now. And Mr. Lei, Beijing's talked about how Hong Kong has a democracy, a democracy with Hong Kong characteristics. I mean, what does it mean by that? It mean it mean it only means that China does not want Hong Kong to have a full democracy under the international human rights law framework. We have the basic law in Hong Kong that uh, promised the people in Hong Kong to have universal suffrage with free and fair elections. And we in Hong Kong, the basic law also guarantees the international covenant on civil and political rights be implemented in Hong Kong. But now with the new uh, propaganda of uh, Hong Kong's demo uh, democracy with Hong Kong characteristics, it only means that they want to bring Hong Kong into a system like in the mainland China. And lots of the propaganda now we can see by the Chinese authorities are mainly targeting uh, its people in the mainland to say Hong Kong still have democracy. But if you ask people in Hong Kong, they will tell you generally that they don't buy this, uh, they don't buy this take. And Mr. Lei, since 2019, the people of Hong Kong have expressed what they would like um, in a democracy. They staged uh, huge protests and it was inspiring for the world to see. But how did Beijing manage to neutralize these kind of efforts? Beijing made good use of its power to introduce a new national security law with a new uh, institutions of national security police in Hong Kong to investigate, arrest, and prosecute people who, meet, who merely made uh, uh, peaceful anti-government speeches, showing slogans, or even to organize or to participate in peaceful voting in civil society, saying them are criminals that endanger national security in Hong Kong and China. And this is quite worrying because now, after almost one and a half year of the imposition of the national security law, we have more than 150 uh, citizens being arrested. And now ha more than half of them are facing trial in the coming years. And, that, and they can be sentenced to a life jail in the future. And this has been creating a chilling effect in society that whatever you are peaceful or militant protesters 
whatever you are academics, you are lawyers, or you are simply uh, a medical uh, workers, if you do not show obedience to Beijing, if you do not show your loyalty to Beijing publicly, you can be seen as the enemy of the state and you could have legal consequences in the future. And Mr. Lackman, well, in recent months, of course, as Ms. Lay just mentioned, there have been massive crackdowns on uh, medical people, uh, medical workers, uh, lawyers, just citizens, journalists, activists after Hong Kong authorities adopted the national security law. Uh, and this stipulates heavy legal penalties for very loosely defined acts of uh, secession, subversion, terrorism and collusion with foreign organisations. And it also criminalises any speech uh, online and written that calls for Hong Kong secession from China. But Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, she's trying to push through now um, Article 23 uh, for the basic law, which allows Hong Kong authorities to punish distance on its own. Why does um, Beijing want to pursue this when the Security Act that it wanted to enforce, it's already done enough to really suppress the freedom of expression? So Article 23 actually has a long history uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, back in 2003, it was the cause of mass protest against uh, the uh, addition to the basic law because Hong Kongers do not want this type of uh, mass punishment laws written into their um, it written into the basic law. And now, a lot of the stipulations under national security law already exist, uh, but what Article 23 would do would essentially cement uh, many of these features into Hong Kong's basic law, which serves as its sort of mini constitution. Currently, uh, the national security law is part of the annex section of the, na of the basic law. Uh, and by adding Article 23, it would really kind of implement it to an even deeper level by further defining what would be punishable uh, and why. Uh, essentially, Beijing wants to be able uh, to really institutionalize this crackdown into as many legal channels as it possibly can. And by adding Article 23, uh, it would essentially be a point of no return for uh, any sort of dissent in Hong Kong. And Mr. Lai, well, Hong Kong's semi-autonomous status, it was supposed to expire in 2047, and many believed that the well, unfortunate reality would be Beijing moving to absorb it. But it looks like that future might already be here. What plans do you think Beijing has for Hong Kong? I think Beijing still want to keep uh, Hong Kong as a facade uh, a mask of a one country, two system to continue to attract foreign investment and business people to continue to invest in Hong Kong and see Hong Kong as a good business hub for both China and for uh, the West's sake. But the reality is that uh, given uh, the new national security law and given their uh, multiple crackdowns on Hong Kong civil society by the governments, that the international community would no longer believe that Hong Kong still enjoy a one country, two systems that China had promised it as early as 1980s. And with the new white paper on Hong Kong's democracy that was issued by Beijing yesterday, we can see China is assertive to bring Hong Kong into one country, one system to converge Hong Kong into part of the mainland system very soon. And Mr. Lackman, do you think there's any hope of international pressure working or any room for negotiation? I mean, sanctions on uh, high level officials seem to have failed so far. Do you think there's just no going back now for the Chinese government? Uh, it's extremely difficult to put pressure on a system when so many of these uh, legal definitions through national security law are already implemented into Hong Kong's law. Uh, even though there's been a lot of pushback from governments around the world, uh, really what governments are trying to do more right now is really provide uh, a safe haven uh, for Hong Kongers who are fleeing Hong Kong, either pro-democracy politicians or activists from the 2019 movement. Uh, unfortunately, uh, whether or not sanctions will be effective uh, we know that sanctions tend not to be uh, particularly strong tools for trying to push back laws like this. Um, but I think at the very least, the kind of symbolic effort that countries are uh, doing to push back against the PRC and, uh, and advocacy for Hong Kong is still uh, a cause worth pursuing. And Mr. Lackman, why do you think the well, if Beijing was going to absorb Hong Kong anyway in 2047, why do you think the Xi Jinping regime is moving to do this right now at this point? You know, given the context of 2019, uh, you know, just a couple of years ago, we saw voter turnout uh, over 70 percent, uh, and it was largely in favor of pro-democracy 
uh, pro-movement politicians who are running for uh, local representation. Uh, and, you know, from the PRC's perspective, the entire 2019 social uh, protest uh, really was a sign that there was potentially something in Hong Kong that uh, was going in a direction that it could maybe no longer control. Uh, and from the PRC's perspective, uh, hastening the timeline or pushing the timeline forward would be the path of least resistance for them. And it would lead to the massive crackdown and harsh uh, repression in Hong Kong. But at the very least, it eliminates this kind of opposition from ever properly growing or ever having the chance to grow in Hong Kong. Uh, essentially, by moving the timeline forward, Xi Jinping and the PRC have been able to uh, make Hong Kong part of its one country, one system much faster and without any sort of uh, need for uh, uh, formal um, discussion from Hong Kongers. I must say, do you think international pressure is going to work? Do you think there's anything that the global community can do? I think it is important that uh, Hong Kong shall be kept on the agenda of the international community. Uh, and there are so many opportunities and uh, uh, spaces for uh, our members of the international community to emphasize on the human rights protections in Hong Kong, that Hong Kong is also part of the international human rights regime. And given that there are so many people in Hong Kong, uh, they are leaving the city to, 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 to be exiled or to relocate uh, for safety reasons, there are so many rooms for international uh, uh, communities and for uh, for the global uh, communities to support these people uh, as migrants or as refugees and to give them a very give them a life with dignity uh, wherever they are. That was Lev Nachman and Eric Lay joining us today from Boston and Washington DC. Thank you both so much for your time. The two Koreas agreed in 2018 to exchange video messages for war-torn families, but unfortunately for the affected families, little progress has been made since then. Thousands of video messages, or you could say e-letters, are still gathering dust as North Korea refuses to take them over the border. Beonji with the details. Kim Sang-yong, now 89 years old, has not been able to see his brothers and sisters in North Korea for more than 70 years and says all he wants is to see them again. Han Gyeong was also separated from his brothers and sisters decades ago, not knowing it would be the last time he'd see them. He called out to his brother in a video message. Tens of thousands of people have remained apart from their loved ones on opposite sides of the border since the Korean War ended in 1953 and left the country divided. In September 2018, the two Koreas agreed in the Pyongyang Joint Declaration to exchange video messages sent by people on each side. The Unification Ministry in Seoul and the Red Cross have been helping people in South Korea record messages for their long-lost relatives. But with inter-Korean relations at a standstill, almost none of them have been delivered. Of more than 24,000 video messages created since 2005, including around 1,000 made this year, only 20 of them have been sent. Now, more than 80% of people with family in the North are over 80 years old, so it's important to get the messages delivered as soon as possible. The two Koreas held face-to-face -face reunions of separated families most recently in 2018, but no reunions have been held since then. The Unification Ministry said it aims to resume in-person or video reunions by next year's Lunar New Year holiday, which is in late January. The ministry also said it hopes Pyongyang will respond to the matter of exchanging video messages. Peunji. Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. 
The U.S. population saw its growth dip to its lowest rate since the nation's founding. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the country grew by only 0.1% as 392,665 were added to the U.S. population from July 2020 to July 2021. It cited the pandemic as the reason for the record low growth as the virus curtailed immigration, delayed pregnancies, and killed hundreds of thousands of people. The latest figure also marks the first time since 1937 that the nation's population grew by less than one million people. Also, in more than two dozen states, deaths outnumbered births for the one-year span. The figure was most notable in the state of Florida, where deaths exceeded births by more than 45,000. Experts say while the U.S. may eventually see a decrease in deaths, population growth likely won't bounce back to what it has been in years past due to fewer births. Dubai's ruler, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, was ordered by the High Court in London on Tuesday to provide a British record of 733 million U.S. dollars to settle a custody battle with his ex-wife over their two children. According to Judge Philip Moore, the massive sum is to ensure their lifetime security, as well as to compensate the ex-wife for the possessions she lost as a result of the marriage breakdown. Nearly $15 million per year will be given for the children's maintenance and for their security when they become adults. While the settlement is believed to be the largest public award ever ordered by an English family court, it's still less than half of the $1.86 billion Princess Haya bint Al Hussein originally sought. The financial settlement comes after Haya fled to Britain in April 2019, fearing for her safety after she began an affair with one of her bodyguards, a month after she had asked the Sheikh for a divorce. During the nearly seven hours of testimony, the 47-year-old ex-wife said a large one-off payment would allow for a clean break and remove the sheikh's hold over her and their children. Portuguese kite surfer Francisco Lufinha successfully crossed the Atlantic using only the power of kites to pull his small boat. The 38-year-old covered some 6,400 kilometers after setting out on November 3rd from Portugal and arriving in the Caribbean island of Martinique on Monday. The trip was made possible as he acquired fresh water for his trip using a hand pump to convert seawater while getting all the power needed on board using solar powers. The kite-powered vessel reached top speeds of over 30 kilometers per hour. With the recent accomplishment, Lufinha now hopes to be inducted into the Guinness World Records for the fastest Atlantic crossing in a kite boat. Lee seung Arirang News. Good morning. It's a cold winter solstice morning here. Well, actually, temperatures are hovering around the season norms, but due to recent mild temperatures, it feels a lot colder. While daily highs will also be a couple of degrees lower this afternoon. So the provinces in Jeju Island will have high levels of fine dust through the morning. Then better airflow will push the dust away and the entire country will enjoy normal to good air quality. Morning temperatures are about 3 to 7 degrees lower than the same time yesterday in most parts. Daejeon and Daegu are starting the day at minus 3 degrees Celsius. Then highs will be 1 to 4 degrees lower this afternoon but are still a couple of degrees higher than norms in most parts of the country. Then cold Arctic air hits Korea just in time for the Christmas weekend. Morning lows will go down to below minus 10 degrees, while east of Gangwon-do, Jeollado and Jeju Island will see snow fall over the holiday. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the world.
And that's all we have for now. We'll be back at 8 a.m. Korea time on Wednesday for our next edition of New Day at Arirang. We appreciate you tuning in. I'm Kim mo -kyan. And I'm Mark Broom. Thank you for joining us as always. Until tomorrow, goodbye.